be with you. Welcome to Worship with Trinity Reformed Church. We are a community God gathers, transforms, and sends to share Christ's expansive love with the world. If you're new to Trinity this morning, we invite you to fill out a welcome card so that we can connect with you and share a little bit about what's happening in our life together. You can find those welcome cards in the Bibles by your seats, or if you're worshiping with us online, you can send us an email, and we'd love to get to know you better. We have a few announcements to remind you about this morning. Um, we are excited this morning to have the very almost Reverend Luke Harkema preaching with us. Luke aced his ordination exams this week and just wowed the classes. Mm -hmm. So a reminder that Luke's ordination service is on June 5th at 3 p.m. here at Trinity. And because of that, at 10 a.m. on June 5th at Trinity, we will not be worshiping. We're encouraging everybody to come to that service in the afternoon, 3 p.m., June 5th, Luke's ordination service. Be there or be square. Um, also, you might see in your bulletin that there's drinks on the deck tomorrow. That is not true anymore. Um, we are postponing that. <laughs> so we'll let you know when we have a new date and time for our next drinks on the deck gathering. But you can and should sign up if you're interested in the Remember trip to the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, we have a couple more weeks to sign up for that. The sign up sheet is at the Welcome Center. If you have any questions about that trip or want to know more, you can talk to John Swanson after worship. And then finally, Today, we have a couple more opportunities as a church family to be together and to learn and to grow and have fun. So the first one is that right after worship at 1115, we are going to have a conversation with First Ward Commissioner Kurt Repart about policing reform. If you are here, you can head downstairs to the fellowship hall for that conversation. If you're online, you can just stick around on this same Zoom link and we'll have that conversation with Kurt via Zoom, right? Is that correct, Glenn? Yes, because of a COVID exposure that Kurt had, but it's gonna be great. We're gonna learn a lot and have some good conversation. Um, if you have kids and you're sticking around for that conversation, they can get together with Miss Amanda and the other building in the basement in the youth room for a movie and some time together. And then this afternoon at 2.30, you are invited to join together for an intergenerational game of ultimate Frisbee at Sweet Street Park. And when we say all ages, all abilities, we really mean that. So if you hear the sound of my voice, you are welcome to come and play some ultimate Frisbee at Sweet Street Park this afternoon at 2.30. Now, as we begin our worship, I'll invite you to turn in your red hymnals to number 768, and we'll sing together, Halle, Halle, Halle. invite you to rise, embody your spirit as God calls us to worship.
Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for you. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let us praise our God together, singing number 593 in our red hymnal, Lord Most High. The ends of the earth, the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, from the heights of the heavens, from the heights of the of the strong from the shouts of the strong from the lips of all people from the lips of all people this song we pray for throughout the endless ages you will be crowned with praises Lord most high exalted of all people. Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and will come again, and all God's people said, amen. I invite you to be seated. Friends, the same God who calls us to worship calls us into confession so that we might experience forgiveness and reconciliation with God and with one another. So let us pray together now. Holy God, you are always doing a new thing. We confess that sometimes we want to close the windows against the fresh air of new ideas, against the noise of other people's worries, against the winds of change. God of every place and time, Forgive us the insulation of our locked homes, our shuttered churches, the security systems of our minds and hearts. Open up our lives that your spirit may blow through. Amen. Having confessed our sin, hear this good news. Jesus declares, peace I leave with you, my peace. I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. 
people of God, let your hearts be stilled, for God loves you and forgives your wrongdoing. Believe this good news and live in its peace. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's share Christ's peace together. No. Good morning, friends. Will you help me sing our prayer for illumination? Be still and know that God is here. Be still and know that God is here. Be still. So today, the scripture comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9. And it begins by telling us that Paul and some of his friends were traveling. So if this happened in the Bible, how do you think they were traveling? You think they were driving in a car? No. Erica, how do you think they were traveling? Horses or donkeys? Yeah, how else might they have been traveling? By walking, yeah. So on the Sabbath or Sunday, they went outside the city gate to the river. And while they were at the river, they met a woman named Lydia. Lydia was a dealer in purple cloth. Do you know why they would tell us it was purple cloth? What? Asher, what do you think? Yeah, purple cloth was super expensive. So I have some purple cloth today. Do you think this was super expensive? No, it's just felt. <laughs> the reason that that purple cloth was so expensive is because it was very difficult to make. So to make the dye for the purple cloth, they, could, they had to use, um, sorry, the dye for the purple cloth came from the veins of shellfish. And these shellfish were only found in this area of the Mediterranean, there was a little bit of liquid inside them and it was white. And when it was exposed to the sun, it would change purple or red. And that's where they would get that dye. How many shellfish do you think that it would take to make a yard or two of purple cloth? Jonah, what do you think? A thousand to a million, that's a big range. Isla, a hundred. Asher, a lot, yeah. Tacey? 5,000, Emma, Google, that's, that's a big number, yeah. It took thousands, you guys were right. Solomon, did you have a guess? Or you just show me your Spider-Man hands. Two 
2,000. Yeah, that's a good guess. It took thousands. Do you know how many shells are in my jar here? It's about 20. It's not very many. So can you imagine thousands and thousands of shells that it would take to make just a little bit of purple dye? So purple clothing was a symbol of status, power, and wealth in Roman times. The beautiful cloth was mainly used by members of royal families, like Asher told us, and Roman senators who had to have a purple band around the edges of their togas or ropes. So purple was very, it was special. It was expensive. It wasn't something that everybody could get. Raise your hand if you've ever... And it's your favorite color. Awesome. Raise your hand if you've ever tie-dyed something. Oh, a lot of you, right? Emma's wearing a tie-dye dress today. She didn't make this one, though. How did you get your dye? Did you have to go and find thousands of shellfish? No. no? You got it from bottles. Yep. Do you think you, you could make it? Yeah. Do you think you would still like to do tie-dye if you had to get the liquid out of thousands of shellfish? Probably wouldn't be as much fun, would it? You had bacon and eggs? Awesome. So anyway, Lydia sold the special, the special purple cloth. Lydia also loved God. She had good friends and she had a successful business selling her purple cloth, right? But she didn't still, she still didn't feel like everything fit. It was like she had a couple pieces of a puzzle but she couldn't fit them together to see what the whole puzzle would look like when it was finished. And then God opened up Lydia's heart. When she heard about Jesus, she recognized the full picture of God's love for humanity. Even better, she wanted other people to see that whole picture of God's love too. So she invited her friends and her family to come to her house and to listen to Paul and Luke tell the good news about Jesus. Pretty cool, right? Will you guys pray with me? Dear God, please give us the same excitement about your love so that we want to share it with everyone we know. Amen. Uh, for those of us who are staying here in the sanctuary, I invite you to turn to number 749 in our red hymnals and we'll sing together Spirit of the Living God. Morning, everyone. Would you like to read the Bible? We are going to start at the beginning, no, at the end, in Revelation. Uh, it's found on page 1008 in our Pew Bibles, and we're 
jumping around just a little bit just so we can get uh, both context and, and ensure some level of brevity. So we're starting in the first column on that page in verse 9, if I can find it. Oh, no, verse 10, excuse me. And then follow me after that. It's not as confusing as I'm making it out to be. <laughs> Let us listen for the living word of God. And in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now we're going to jump to verse 22. That's in the second column. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light. And its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the trees for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their forehead, and there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is the word of God. Thanks, Peter. Uh, our second reading comes to us from the book of Acts. That can be found. Let me look in the bulletin here. Excuse me. On page 900. Wonderful. That will be Acts 16. And I'm going to go ahead and start at verse 6. They went through the region of Phrygia in Galatia, having been forbidden by the Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Benthia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas during the night. Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When we had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convicted that God had called us to proclaim the good news there. We set sail for Troas and took a straight course from the Samarots and following day, Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We resided uh, in the city for some days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the gates by the river when we, where we supposed a place of prayer would be. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city uh, of Thintra, a dealer of purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged them, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of God. Thanks be.
theologian Judy Hart Angelo and Gary Pornsey once wrote, making your way in the world today takes everything you got. Making, taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't it be nice to get away? Sometimes you've just got to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You've got to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You've got to go where everybody knows your name. As some of you may have suspected, these writers are not theologians, but they are the co-writers to the theme song of the hit 80s sitcom, Cheers. But there's something true in those lyrics, isn't there? It seems like all sorts of sitcoms understand the importance of having a place of belonging. Whether it's the bar in Cheers, the diner in Seinfeld, or the coffee shop in Friends, all of these places show the importance of having a place where beloved characters can relax and be themselves. It's like having a home away from home. Maybe you have a place like that where you feel like you truly belong. Unfortunately, the folks in our story today may not have had that feeling for quite a while. Today, our story starts with Paul and Stylus having to sojourn straight through two terms because they were forbidden from speaking there. And that's the only start of their traveling tribulations. This dynamic duo then tried their luck in other cities like Mycia and Bithynia, but they were stonewalled there as well. They just can't seem to catch a break. The scriptures tell us that the Spirit was continually redirecting these apostles. However, we do not know whether she directly spoke to these apostles or if she just closed enough doors in their faces until they got the hint. Either way, I've got the feeling that these travel-weary evangelists were starting to hope for a place where they could put their feet up, at least for a little while. That's when Paul and Silas arrive in Philippi, and after a few uh, unfruitful days in town, they travel outside the city gates for a riverside prayer meeting. You see, it was common practice for Jews to worship down by the river when they did not have a synagogue in town. And while it can be lovely to get outside of the city and reconnect to God's creation, I wonder if any of these women wish they had a place to call their own so that they did not have to practice their faith on the margins of society outside the city limits. Perhaps some of these women were praying for a physical space where they could belong. This is the point where Lydia comes center stage. And I'll be honest with you, I have no idea how Lydia got here. She's not originally from Philippi, and based on her name, scholars assume that she's not ethnically Jewish. So how in the world did she find her way into this particular community? She's a dealer of purple, after all, as we've just learned about, a commodity that was quite popular amongst the wealthy owners of the Philippian mines. These tycoons that drew gemstones and precious metals from the earth, wouldn't you think that Lydia's station in life would have given her some access to this upper echelon of the aristocracy? I don't know. I imagine Lydia's gender could have excluded her from hobnobbing with the rich and famous. However, in my research this week, I was unable to learn much about the mores of Philippian high society. Regardless, I think it is really jarring to see Lydia, a dealer of such luxuries, prostrating herself down in the brambles outside of town. What's all that about? I really do wonder, why is Lydia here? What's she looking for? Perhaps despite her economic success, Lydia is still looking for some inner peace. Or maybe she's longing to feel like she belongs to something higher. In one sense or another, I think everyone in this story is looking for a place of belonging. Whether it's Paul and Silas struggling to find a welcoming city, this group of pious women that are without a house of worship, or Lydia, this successful businesswoman, uh, still hasn't found what she's looking for. 
I wonder how these seekers might have relevance today. I wonder what the ever-traveling Paul and Silas would have to say about the hostile architecture that defines many of our urban areas in the United States. Things like benches designed with intentionally uncomfortable armrests or downwardly slanted seats to ensure that anyone's respite there is never quite comfortable. This kind of architecture was designed to send a particular message, especially to homeless folks. They say this place might be public, but your welcome here is very limited. Unfortunately, our cities can be quite unwelcoming when we want them to be. And what do you think these synagogueless prayer warriors would have to say about the redlining in Grand Rapids real estate markets, a system that denies opportunities to business owners and uh, homeowners that are people of color? What would these Philippian women have to say about the gentrification that is taking place here on the west side that erodes the hopes of affordable housing and displaces longtime residents from their once beloved neighborhoods? Are we expecting these folks to simply go down by the river while their old stomping grounds are reduced to upscale apartments in chic microbreweries? The kind of belonging we're talking about here is a basic material one. Those who seek this type of belonging are asking very basic questions. Am I allowed to sit down? Can I have a place to stay? Unfortunately, in many cases, these questions have already been answered by powerful people, people that have decided who gets to be in the in-group or the out-group. And for those forced out to the margins, I imagine it might be easy to wonder, am I even allowed to exist here? For some, the simple quest of belonging is already an act of resistance in the eyes of the insiders. However, not everyone in this story is on that particular quest. Lydia, after all, has carved out a place for herself in Philippi. She has a job and a house of her own. So if she is searching for belonging, I would imagine it would be of a more spiritual sort. You know, this kind of thing can be kind of hard to put your finger on. It might be experienced differently by different people, but I'll do my best to try to put this into words. Have you ever been having a usual run-of-the-mill day at work, and then kind of out of nowhere in a moment of stillness, you feel this aching loneliness in your heart. Even though you're surrounded by people, you just get this vague but unavoidable feeling that you miss someone. Or maybe you have found yourself in the middle of a sleepless night, wrestling with your bedding to try to find a comfortable position to no avail. Perhaps you gave up and stared up at the ceiling and then all of a sudden you were struck with this sinking feeling of longing that seemed to suck your heart down through the floorboards. Sometimes I've learned when I feel this way, I just need a hug and a friend to talk to, but sometimes it feels deeper than that. I've come to think, at least for me, that this longing is a longing to belong to God. Not necessarily in a possessive sense, but in the sense that I long to be seen and understood and embraced by God. I want to belong to God in the same way I belong to my loved ones. And praise the Lord, it looks like Lydia found that sort of belonging. We read that Lydia's heart was opened up to call Paul's gospel message like the bloom of a spring flower opening to the sun. Maybe this has happened to you where someone says something that just unlocked part of your brain or your heart or your spirit or just some part of you that you hadn't been in touch with for a very long time. And all of a sudden, you're filled with energy and this warm, joyful glow. We can see this sense of joy well up and overflow in Lydia as she is inspired to perform acts of generosity and hospitality. Moments before, she was down in a riverbed looking for belonging, and now she's welcoming people into her own home, a home that Paul, Silas, and other Philippian Christians would return to time and again. This woman who once searched for belonging has now provided 
a home of belonging for her entire community. I don't know about you, but I think this is a fantastic vision of what the church could be. A place for seeking and sharing, a place where the gifts of belonging are both given and received, a place where God's embrace of us inspires us to offer a similar embrace to the world. As I pondered over this text this week, I have been reminded of the importance of both sorts of belonging. The physical kind that says, have a seat, you can stay here. And the spiritual kind that says, I see you, I know you, and I embrace you. Both belongings are important. After all, the Heidelberg Catechism says that we belong to God both in body and in soul. If this is the kind of belonging that God gives to us, then I've got to believe that this is the kind of belonging that we should be seeking out for our neighbors. We should advocate for affordable housing and work to provide aid for those of our neighbors in our neighborhoods that are homeless. We should listen to our neighbors in a way that seeks to deepen understanding. And we should encourage each other as we each walk on our own paths of discipleship, seeking to find a deeper awareness of how truly and deeply we belong to God. Perhaps with God's help, the church could be a place where everybody belongs. Let's pray. God, you walk with us through our journeys like you did with Paul and Silas. You find us on our way, whether that is in a house of worship or down by the river or somewhere else entirely. And you find ways for us to make our work and our resources usable and meaningful in the kingdom of God. Thank you for claiming us as your own and for loving us so dearly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our song of response this morning, I believe, is in your bulletin insert, Your Labor is Not in Vain.
Our great prayer of thanksgiving is found in number 811 in our red books. After our great prayer is completed, we are invited to come forward, beginning in the front rows and using the center aisles to come down. Uh, please feel free to go to whatever serving station is most open. We'll hold out our hands to receive a piece of gluten-free bread. After eating, we'll take a cup with our fingers, drink, and place the used cup in the tray by the offering plates. If you wish to remain in your seat, please do so and raise a hand. The server will bring the elements to you. Now let's begin our great prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Now lift up your hearts. We lift them in praise. and right it is in our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all of its hosts and earth with all of its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserved us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love and sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For this precious gift of his mighty Savior, who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. With the whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. God. We remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Your death, O Christ, we proclaim. Your rising celebrate your coming we await to make all things new all glory unto you send us holy send your holy spirit upon us we pray that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.
our Savior Jesus Christ, on the same night he gave himself up for us, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke the bread, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Christ took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, remembrance of me. This is the bread of life. Let all who hunger come and eat. This is the cup of salvation. Let all thirst come and drink. These are the gifts of God for the, the people, people of God. God. Come, for all things are now ready. See 
Having been fed at God's table and from God's word, we offer a prayer of gratitude and intercession. God, to whom all people and nations will stream, finding nourishment, healing, and peace, thank you for giving us a foretaste of that blessing at this table. Nourished by your body and blood, make us your hands and feet in this world. Help us to live the prayers we offer on behalf of your creation, using our gifts, our time, and our offerings to serve your work of letting justice flow and making all things new. God, send your spirit to renew the face of the earth. As the earth around us blooms with the flowering of spring, help us to honor and protect the wonderful gifts of nature. Help us to live in harmony with this world, appreciating its beauty, receiving its healing touch, and supporting the interwoven connections of mutuality that sustain all life. We give you thanks that river otters are once again splashing and playing in the Detroit River after a hundred year absence. Help us to work with you for healthy air, water, and soil everywhere. And God, have mercy on those in Gaylord mourning the death and destruction wrought by the wild winds of a tornado. God, send your spirit to renew the face of the earth. You bless the church with leaders like Lydia and Paul who share your good news. And you continue to raise up leaders to guide your people. We thank you for our consistory leaders and their work to lead us into our next season of life. May the work of this weekend's consistory retreat bear much fruit. We thank you for Luke, for guiding him through his classes exams, for calling him to serve in Stanton, for giving him the heart and skills and the willingness to learn that make for a good pastor. And thank you for your church here, Give all of us uh, a renewed sense of mission so that we work for the life and health of the whole world. God, send your spirit to renew the face of the earth. You judge the people with equity and guide the nations of the earth. Give to all leaders and people the gift of wisdom and the spirit of peace. We pray for an end to violence and wars. We thank you for those in Kharkiv who have been liberated from occupation. Help them to rebuild their homes, their city, 
their lives. We pray for those taken captive from Mariupol and for all prisoners of war. Grant them patience, endurance, and healthy living conditions. Make for them a path home. God, send your spirit to renew the face of the earth. You are with us, and your spirit goes out to comfort all people. Help those in North Korea and every place where COVID is overwhelming health care systems. Open hearts and policies so that vaccines and treatments might go to where they are needed. Heal the communities in Buffalo, in Laguna Woods, and now in Kentwood, as the fabric of life in these places has been shattered by hatred and fear erupting in gunfire. Heal the minds of people numbed by pain and twisted by vile systems of belief. Help all those on the path of destruction to turn back and guide our society to recognize patterns of violence before they manifest themselves in death. God, send your spirit to renew the face of the earth. We give you thanks for the many blessings of our lives. Most of all, for the people you give us to share the journey of life with. We lift up these loved ones and ask you to bless them in this moment. We also pray for Clayton's family as they mourn the death of Faye and give thanks for his life. We pray for Francine as she recovers from knee surgery. Grant her comfort and persistence. God, send your spirit to renew the face of the earth. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All of our lives find their source and fulfillment in you. So help us to live out the prayer Jesus teaches us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our song of sending is number 302 in our red books. I invite you to rise and body your spirit as we sing, Hear Our Praises.
as the water o'er the sea. From the mountains to the valley, hear our praises rise to you. From the heavens to the nations, hear our singing. Reminder, after worship today, right downstairs, there's a critical conversation with Kurt Rephardt. But as we go from this place, wherever we go, we go to be the church and we go with God's blessing. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Amen.